Welcome to Higher Praise. Okay, good evening. We'll go ahead and get started here. We'll open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we once again give you all the praise and glory for all the good that we are experiencing here, especially still having our freedom, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, that uh, your hand around the world will allow some of those that are being terribly persecuted to have, a, have some relief and that uh, a breath of fresh air for them, Lord. Uh, they know that you're Lord. They are serving you diligently. And we just ask, Lord, if it be your will to just give them a moment of pause. We ask the leaders all around the world, Lord, that there may be some restraint on the evil that's going on and that some people will be spared the onslaught that's coming towards them. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, a couple things we'll jump in on. Um, things that are important as far as uh, end-time prophecy. Um, one thing that we're anticipating is that the Gog-Magog war is going to occur. Uh, we know it's going to occur. Of course, we don't know exactly when, but uh, we are told to, you know, pay attention and kind of understand and read the times and be aware that, you know, you could be at the preposes of this. Uh, a couple of things that happened this last week. One big one is uh, probably under the radar on most news channels, but uh, after Israel decided to help Ukraine in some fashion part of the way part of the thing they're doing they're they're they've been uh, came out there sending intelligence some of their intelligence to the uk to the ukrainians and they're trying to work with systems to help uh, circumvent the drones that are coming out of iran well the next day russia said oh by the way uh, we're in the process of upgrading our some of our nuclear capabilities in terms of the rockets that they use they have a new generation of icbm that they're they're sending in or that they're replacing an old level under the old salt treaty which was i don't know how many of you remember that or not that was a strategic arms limitation treaty that was uh, done quite a few years ago i think reagan had a big part in that if memory serves me right but anyhow, under that treaty, whenever something like this was to occur, that everyone had agreed, well, we'll only have so many nukes. And if we decide to upgrade our nukes, we will destroy the old ones as we upgrade to the new ones. And I think, by and large, the United States lived up to that agreement. Uh, Russia has not. And here's a prime example. The old ICBMs that they are getting rid of and replacing with a new generation they've decided and they put out well we're going to send these nukes to syria only we're just going to, we're going to send the missiles to syria i didn't misspoke there they're not selling sending the nukes they're sending the missiles that carry the nukes they're just replacing the nuclear warheads with conventional weapons so they're not destroying the rockets the rockets can fairly quickly be changed from conventional weapons to nuclear weapons, and they're setting them in Israel's back door. And so this you know, was taken as a direct response to Israel saying they were going to help the Ukraine. But the thing of it is that these missiles being placed there will is another incremental step towards whenever the Gog-Magog war takes place that Israel's going to be surrounded with their enemies and they'll have an onslaught from the north. And this is just another step to where if Russia or Turkey or whoever from the north is going to be Gog, it's going to be coming down. Most people think it's Russia inspired. Uh, this gives them another weapon at their disposal whenever that takes place. So I see that as another incremental step towards the, the Gog-Magog war. You're just adding another level of, uh, of weaponry in the area. The other thing that happened 
which is important and involves Russia again. How many of you picked up on uh, Ahmoud Abbas, who is the Palestinian leader uh, in Israel? He came out and they, they were talking again about getting together and talking about the two-state solution. And he made it known, well, now listen, America, we'll, t we'll, we'll talk to you some more. We're going to, we're going to pr approach this again. But we want Russia involved. They, he literally said, we no longer trust the American to be a, a good partner in this. So they want a four-sided negotiations to take place. It will be Israel, Russia, United States, and the Palestinians, the PLO. So that's a big deal. Here again, another small incremental step that sets the stage for a Gog-Magog war that Ezekiel 37, 38 prophesies is going to take place because you're bringing Russia in to the mix. And it just really, to be honest with you, it just strengthens the uh, thought process that Gog is more than likely, you know, maybe Russian. So I thought those were two big things that happened that will, um, could possibly, you know, further the stage being set. Um, while we're in the Mideast, might as well talk about OPEC a little bit. Um, OPEC, of course, they had uh, said that they're going to go ahead and cut their production 2 million barrels a day. They also released the fact that the Biden administration was urging them not to announce this until after our elections. Now, if that can be proven, that's an impeachable offense on Biden. And the thing of it is, you know, you, if you notice, you know, I, I can't believe I, we, we had a pastor and I sat and talked with a gentleman yesterday that's been in Ukraine. And uh, he's, he's obviously got quite a bit of worldwide experience under his belt in talking with him. And he, we were talking a little bit about politics and I made the comment that, uh, and he did, he agreed. The, we're talking about if the Republicans take over in November in the House and Senate, we have an opportunity, but only if they live up to the rhetoric that they talk about. I don't trust them. I don't, I don't trust either side, I'll guarantee you. I have no trust in any of them. And there's, you know, there's some of them going to have to prove some things to me before I'll stand up and say, yeah, I, I think this, you're the real deal. But the, um, the thing it is, I can't believe that it's obvious that we have a president that does not have the mental capacity to be president. Did you pick up on, he, he gave a little talk the other night, supposed to be a private talk to some Democratic donors. Did you pick up on what he said about Pakistan? Pakistan is a nuclear country. They have nuclear weapons. And while they haven't been a hand-in-hand -hand partner with us over the years, they, they have always proven to be people that have, even though they have different ideology, and even though they have different ideas on how things should go, they show, you know, the Pakistani government has shown year after year after year that they, when you talk with them and you partner with them on things, they're good to their word. And they have managed their nuclear capability. See, India, you know, we shouldn't forget, India and Pakistan are mortal enemies. They're both nuclear countries. They have armed incursions almost constantly and have had for years and years, decades now. And, but yet, they show restraint when dealing with each other. And Pakistan's always done that. Biden stands up there at night, blows them up, and says, "Well, oh, those guys, those Pakistanis, they're, you can't trust what they're doing. They're a nuclear country. I mean, it was terribly embarrassing. He, he has made almost, especially the last few weeks, because they're trying to get him out in front of the, some of the donors and some of the groups to try to get some Democratic votes. 
He steps on his tongue every time he goes anywhere to speak. And, but yet, you know, the whole time Trump, especially the last half of his, his term, they were trying to gender up the 25th Amendment, which is the process we have in place to remove an incompetent president. That's all you heard about on the news week after week after week. We hear none of that now. Even from the Republicans, that's the point I'm trying to make. I don't see any Republicans standing up and saying, this man needs to be evaluated and removed if he's not competent, which obviously he isn't. I, you know, I can't, I would, could argue with anybody who wants to argue about facts, say, oh, well, I think he's competent. The thing that's scary along with it, 40% of the people in this country still support him and think he's on the right track. That shows you the sorry state we're in with the people not... And, and it's, it's back, it's biblical again. The reason I'm making, making this point is that we are told in the end times that people will be disillusioned. People will have a veil over their eyes. People will not recognize what's true. And that's, we're seeing it just lived out on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't know. The fact, you know, I, I have no idea, but it's the fact that no one has the strength to stand up and do what's right. right. And what's right is he's incompetent. Obvi you know, in my, that's my I mean, opinion. I feel like she would be incompetent too. She well, I think she is. I, yeah. I don't think she's a very intelligent so person based on her. watching her. Uh, I, I don't know that for a fact, but she doesn't show any signs of being the type of leader we need in the times that we're in. All the time. So, anyhow, we'll move on from that. Um, talking about the administration, we're still in the Mideast. Russia is getting all these drones from Iran. All right, buying them from Iran. Uh, Iran is buying all their oil now that they need from Russia. And the United States is funding it all because we have done two things. We gave them about $17 billion in cash that was tied up. We lifted those sanctions. We lifted the sanctions on them shipping arms or selling drones. We gave them, that's one of the other sanctions that was lifted. We said, you can go ahead and sell your drones. So we're funding that whole thing. Here we are funding the Ukrainians, and at the same time we're funding Russia, through Iran, getting their drones. So, you know, it's just, it just as messed up as it's always now. One thing I want to throw out that's kind of important for you to stop and think about a little bit. Who else is rapidly buying Iranian drones? Venezuela. And what's the range on the drones that they're using? 2,000 kilometers, okay? Well, that 2,000 kilometers will take in all of Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama. All those places can be reached with drones launched from Venezuela. And they're rapidly purchasing the Iran drones as we stand here and speak. So I thought that was a little interesting side note the, um, we'll stay in the Mideast here for a minute. As I always say, the Mideast is a key to all this. We'll talk about the Ukrainian thing here in a minute, but Ukraine's a sidebar to, to really what's important is going on. Ukraine's kind of setting the stage for some of these other things to happen, just like what we're talking about. The, um, since Biden has messed up the relationship we had with Saudi Arabia, the South African delegate, one of the South African delegates just the day before yesterday made it known that Saudi Arabia wants to join BRICS. And you may not remember what BRICS is. I, I made mention to this the other day and I was talking about the Warsaw Pact that formed the Soviet Union. Um, 
back in 1955? Well, BRICS is a similar type organization, and where the BRICS come from is B-R-I-C-S, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. That's BRICS. That's an organization that was formed just here a few years ago for mutual workings and mutual assurance. Well, guess who wants to join it? Saudi Arabia wants to join BRICS. So, you know, stop and think about that. And here it is, here again, what's going on, so that you put it in perspective, is similar to what happened with the, the uh, prior to World War II, where you had countries lining up on each sides of the border, or each sides of the ideologies. You had it with the Warsaw Pact back in 1955, where those countries all got together and said, oh, by the way, we don't agree with what this, the West is. NATO came out of this, or NATO was in existence at that time, but that's why the Warsaw Pact come together was to, to offset what was going on in NATO which was a new organization at that time. You have the same thing happen again, as Pastor tells us over and over. There's nothing new. It's just history repeating itself. And as I said the other, the other day, the very best intelligence on, you can have on what's going to happen and what is happening is history, because it is repeating itself. And that's exactly what's going on here. You've got NATO and the Western alliances, and now you have BRICS plus, it looks like Saudi Arabia is making an effort to join. So you have people of different ideologies and different ways of looking at things, trying to decide who's going to come out ahead on all this and whose side do I want to be on. That's what it amounts to. And that's you know, another step. Um, working off my little notepad again tonight. I'm, I'm getting really bad about uh, not remembering what I've got to do on Wednesday afternoons. Okay, the, let's, let's go to Ukraine for a minute. One thing that happened today, I, I picked up on, and we talked about it, Pastor and, and I, and uh, was we were sitting in the meeting last night, or yesterday afternoon, I had gotten a note that Biden was going, to, or not Biden, but Putin was going to declare war today. And I think they had their notes a little shuffled, but what he actually did, he declared martial law in the four provinces of eastern Ukraine that he had declared that was part of, now part of Russia. That gives him the ability to go in and set curfews and use the military to, to uh, you know, put a bigger crunch or more control on it. One thing that was interesting with the gentleman pastor and I met with yesterday, uh, he's been in Ukraine, he just came back. He's been working over there, he's an ex-Marine. He's been working over there as a, kind of like a paramedic of sorts. Uh, he talked about that he had a, uh, a trauma kit put together and what he was doing on his own by, you know, he, he was talking about God directed him into this. Um, he was living over there. He's in Odessa. Odessa's down in a little town, I think it's called Nikolas. Uh, he said he was at, that's outside uh, Odessa. Odessa's down in the, in the southwest part of the Black Sea. It's in the southwest part of, the, of Ukraine. Uh, it's not over near Russia at this time. It's fairly close to Crimea, uh, which of course Russia controlled. But anyhow, he was talking about the bombs and the missiles coming in and that uh, he would go out and try to help trauma victims was what he was doing. But uh, the, the interesting thing, he was talking about how the, he, gave, he talked about that um, one, one day they, a rocket had went off and they went down to where the fire was and they were gonna go in, try to go into a, a burning building to help see if there's anyone in there. Well, he, he was, it was himself and, and a couple other guys. One of the other guys was a police officer that was armed. Well, when they got there, they, they have kind of like local police 
it'd be similar, if you think about it in the state of Indiana, kind of be would like having a local police officer and then you've got a National Guard that controls our state area. They could be involved. And anyhow, in this case here, the regional, he, he described it as the local police and then they have a regional police force and then they have the army. You've got three different categories. Well, this regional police stopped them from going in. And I guess the way he talked, they kind of maybe got into a little bit of a heated argument about it. They were insisting they needed to go and he did not. Whoever the policeman that was with them that had the weapon must have got a little more forceful with the guy and ended up being arrested because he wanted to go in. He said, you, know, you can kind of imagine, he didn't give the details, but I kind of imagined he's just talking. He had this cop saying, hey, this is, my, this is my town. That building's burning, I'm going in. And because of the fact he was armed, they arrested him. Um, similar type things coming here eventually. That's why, you know, the vision of Homeland Security, these people are armed to the teeth. And we'll start seeing a regional type, possibility a regional type force similar to what this guy was talking about. But anyhow, it's, um, he, he was talking about how, you know, the bombing, the, myth, the uh, drones are, are coming in. Um, he talked about that they were pretty easy to, fairly easy to knock down. But the things I read, they're not. I watched a couple of videos to where the, the drones move very slowly. They're fairly large, delta-shaped, and um, they move slow, kind of like one of our ultralights is what they do. They run off of a similar type engine, a little, little two-cycle engine. But uh, they're not that easy to, to kill, according to everything I've read. And they are doing damage to the point that over in Ukraine now, they reported, and this is the Ukrainian government reported, 30% of their electricity has been knocked out. And uh, if you want to know about the weather over there, it's just like it is right here. If you look, if you look on a map, look at your globe, we're setting roughly at the 40th latitude above the equator. 40th latitude runs right across through south central Ukraine. They're on the same level of weather as we are. Very, very similar. So you can imagine without electricity, if you hadn't, did not have any electricity the last few days, you'd be pretty uncomfortable. You wouldn't be freezing to death, but you're not going to be comfortable, that's for darn sure. But with winter coming on, the winter over there is very similar to the winter here. The um, this, talking about energy shortage, 60% of the companies that were surveyed in Great Britain, in the UK, have said that they are facing shutdown this winter if something's not done to ensure that the energy grid's put back together. Um, they... Uh, the thing it is, as I said here a few weeks ago, this energy thing in Europe is going to affect the entire world. And one way it's going to affect it is the fact that there's so much production of stuff that's even done in Europe that ends up over here. You're, you know, it's going to affect it. One of the big things, especially in our part of the world, is fertilizers. Uh, the majority of our fertilizer comes out of Europe. And uh, it takes a lot of natural gas to make fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer. So that's going to have a major impact. I noticed a thing I read uh, in successful farming news release today. They're talking about they were in it. I don't know why it kind of surprised me. They said they were surprised by the response they're getting from the farmers that they're not real up on next year. They're not thinking next year's going to be could be a really good year. It could be a could be a hurting year of some sort. And one of the major reasons, the magazine said they were surprised people said that because if you look at the markets, you'd say, oh man, we're going to have a great new year next year. But it's this unknown on the uh, ingredients you need to put your crop together that's going to tell the story next year. Plus, 
the fact that with what's going on with inflation, you know, that's why I was talking about several weeks ago, what's going on in the economies over there is gonna roll over into here, and it already is. One of the biggest problems we have is the inflation, which here again, here's our president eating an ice cream cone. Did you see that? Yeah. yeah. Biden's out eating ice cream cone. He said, oh, our, our economy's great. Couldn't be better. Everything's rolling on good. Well, it's not. We pastor have been talking about this for the last year, so six months. We've talked about it here. The economy's not in good shape, and you're seeing more and more companies forecasting, especially the big banks and some of the big financials, we will be in full recession come for next year. Uh, how deep it's going to be, I don't know, but I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, what they call a 60-40 portfolio. A 60-40 portfolio is where 60% of your money is in stocks, 40% is in bonds. And typically, if you have that ratio over the years, you grow. Because bond market usually responds opposite of the stock market and vice versa. So that if you've got your money spread out in a 60-40 relationship, you will grow. The only problem is this go around is, they've been keeping these records, by the way, for over 100 years, or right at 100 years, since back in the 1920s. Right now, this, and they, you can look at it each year, and they, they will graph this, each year it goes along and shows you how the 60-40 portfolio performed. Right now, it's the worst in history, and it's worse than it was in the Great Depression. They started keeping records in 1922. The depression didn't occur to the 30s. The 60-40 portfolio graph right now is the worst in history. It's worse than the Great Depression in the 1930s. So that's giving you an indication of what people are thinking about is going to be happening on an economic standpoint. And the thing that is, it, it's going to accelerate things. Here at home, they're trying to control the inflation the Federal Reserve is by raising the interest rates. You can do that to a point, but the problem with it is that when you raise the, when you do that, it makes the dollar stronger in relationship to the world. When our interest rates are going higher, you can earn more interest with American dollars. So that makes the dollar stronger, if you think of it in that term in that, that concept. Well, what's the problem with a strong dollar? Anybody that's buying stuff from us overseas has to pay more and get less for their money. So if they're getting, they're getting less for the money, they tend to buy less. You follow me? Our stuff gets ex more expensive. We finally gets to the point that said, I can't afford that, I'm gonna go something else. So, it starts putting a drag on all the economies, clear around the world. And these plants in Europe, uh, in the UK, if they're starting to shut down, here, here's the thing, they're gonna shut down to survive. You, you have this thing, um, if you got, get into macroeconomics and you get into ec and economics on a, on a micro scale to where you're looking at plants and things, you have a point of diminishing returns. And once you get below that point, you finally get down to where it makes more sense to do nothing and shut the doors and keep what you've got and hope for things to turn around and you can start back up. That's what the 60% of the companies in Europe's faced with right now. They're faced with the fact we gotta shut down to survive. We gotta keep what capital we got Hopefully this thing turns around and we can go back to work later. But what it does puts all these people out of work. And, you know, we saw it here during the Great Depression when you saw the soup lines and things of that nature. It, it's the same thing and it's, it's happening over again. The um, war in Ukraine is kind of, and I'm about out of time right now, the, the war in Ukraine is a funny, funny thing to watch you keep getting indications that the Ukrainians are winning, and they have been doing quite well in some areas with the help of NATO and the United States. But at the, 
one thing that's occurring, if Russia can keep dragging this thing on, we're going to run out of help to send them. And that's, I've been reading a little bit on some of the military channels. There's some general staff officers already saying enough's enough. They're saying we got to quit sending our stuff overseas if you expect us to defend ourselves. And at the same time, you see Biden, you know, the, the strategic reserve, he announced today they're taking another 15 million barrels out right now. And the reason they're doing that, of course, is try to drop the price of gas before the election. That's the only reason they're doing it. So we, we're not in, a, not in a strong situation to keep sending stuff to the Ukrainians. The, uh, and NATO is the same way. Uh, if you start reading some of the European newspapers, there's some things starting to pop up. We, we can only do so much. So if Russia can drag this thing on for a while and drain the resources of the people on the other side, this could be probably, I think, in a little different ball game. The big thing that did happen this week, and I'll end out on that, uh, Belarus, which sets to the north and slightly east of the Ukraine, but basically north of Ukraine. Uh, Belarus is a uh, sides with Russia, although they haven't joined the wars yet, but they did move 70,000 troops down to the Ukrainian-Belarus border this last week. They call it a military training exercise, but they gathered 70,000 troops and all their equipment and everything and put them just north of Kiev in the Ukraine. They're within striking distance of Kiev. And what that, well, the reason they did that is that it makes Ukrainians, where the Ukrainians were over pushing against the Russian border, trying to push Russia back out of those provinces. Now they got to stop and worry about, we can't put all of our troops over here because if Belarus does come in from the north, they would be in Kiev before they could respond. So they have to kind of split their forces. So it's, you know, it's a good, very, very good military move on, the, on Russia's part to divide Ukrainian forces, make them weaker as, as this goes on. So there's a lot going on. Um, not a whole lot over in the Koreans except North Korea. They're getting ready to test another, uh, hydro, or another atomic weapon. And uh, they launched a bunch of missiles the other day conventional missiles down right on the South Korean border. And it was just a training exercise, but boy, it sure got South Korea's attention real quick. And they, they went to the UN trying to request a condemnation on it. Uh, and then the only other thing, you know, China has their big convention going on this week. Jinping's going to be back in as the ruler still, and he's consolidated his strength, so he's going to be stronger than he was. And the one thing I picked up on persecution over there today, the Catholic Church has agreed, again, they signed another agreement with China that China gets to pick all their bishops. Uh, and I know I reported on that when that happened in 2018. Was a, when they did it, they had, a, had an agreement in place that before the archdiocese can announce a bishop in China, has to be approved by communists. China. So, anyhow, a lot going on, folks. Uh, if you got any questions or anything, holler at me later and we'll talk about it, but uh, it just keeps ticking on a little bit at a time.